This is our third and final panel of the conference, uh, The Weight of Expectation, Personal Hardship in Places and Periods of Prosperity. Um, we will begin uh, with a talk from Sam Davis, who is uh, actually the counselor for Queen Edith Ward in Cambridge. And um, I think she's going to give quite an interesting overview of, of some of the work um, that she's been engaged with there. So as as with the rest of the with the rest of the panels, uh, it will be a 20 minute presentation format, um, followed by 30 minutes of questions at the end. So presenters, I'll let you know if you like when it's been about 15 minutes. OK, thank you very much, Neve. Uh, I will now attempt to share my screen. So, yes, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the last day and a half's um, content. Uh, I'm not an academic at all. I come to this very much um, from a. Uh, kind of interested citizen point of view, I guess. Um, I have made some attempts to inform myself, and I, I guess my interest really could be best described as place-based approaches. I feel very rooted in this place. Um, I've lived in Cambridge for 35 years. I've lived in Queen Edith's Ward, down in the south of the city for 25 years. I um, have chaired the sort of neighborhood association uh, for the whole area since 2015. And in 2021, I was elected as an independent city councillor for this area. Um, so I, I feel reasonably able to talk about my perspectives on what's going on down here. Um, and, I, and I think it has a as well as being superbly interesting to me, I think it does have a wider um, relevance because Queen Edith is kind of at the sharp end of Cambridge's story as a global tech phenomenon. And um, interestingly, while as a geographical space, we are central, I would argue, to the city's economic development, we're also slightly out on a limb. Um, Part of that's be, uh, because we are not in the city parliamentary constituency. We're actually in South Cams, um, which creates a different dynamic, I think. Um, and also politically, uh, Queen Edith tends to return Liberal Democrat councillors. And since 2014, the city council has had a Labour majority. And I think that does have that political party political element does have some bearing on how things work here as well so um i think this should be a, a helpful complement to nikki's talk yesterday nikki's talk was very much about disadvantage at award level and i'm talking about something which is uh even more granular than that so um let's let's see where we go I, the, the talk's entitled Double Disadvantage, and the thing I'm interested in is the kind of intersection of poverty and inequality. So being poor, being disadvantaged in a place where other people aren't. And as I'll go on to explain, that's the situation in Queen Edith's. Um, obviously, disadvantage is, is damaging per se. But when you share a place with people who don't suffer from, from that same degree of disadvantage, I think there's also a sort of element of um, emotional pain that comes with it. And there's none of the supporting ecosystem that one might find in other places with wider uh, deprivation. So as Nikki described yesterday, there's quite a strong um, effort from statutory agencies and others to address the, uh, the deprivation in wards like Abbey. But my contention would be that both in terms of facilities and services and also kind of narrative and advocacy, there is a hidden uh, level of deprivation and disadvantage in Queen Edith's uh, because we are so widely perceived as being a um, an affluent area, but but I suspect what the data would show is that we are the most unequal ward in the most unequal city in the country. 
So the, the public faces of Queen Ediths, for, for people who, who are not familiar with this, they, they basically have two um, dimensions to them. One is about the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, which is this global uh, tech centre, you know, dual in the UK's research uh, provision. And um, sitting alongside that, a perception of a very leafy, uh, comfortable suburb. You know, so new housing stock coming in, which is marketed on that basis. And as, as that uh, little snip from the Cambridge News demonstrates, uh, five of the most expensive houses sold in Cambridge last year were in Queen Ediths. So that's that's the public perception, I think. But what I'd like to do in this is is make the the hidden visible and, and it is hidden. Um, and that comes through in lots of different ways. So, for example, a very senior member of the university who lives on one of the affluent roads in Queen Ediths told me at a, a, a recent meeting that he'd never been to the area I'm going to talk about. It must be, you know, less than half a mile from his house. He didn't know it existed. Why would he? He has no need to go there. There is nothing there for him. Similarly, when uh, a local developer released that, that nine wells development onto the market, uh, the community forum offered to help them with their marketing. I looked at a map of local features that was in their sales collateral, and I pointed out to them that a small parade of shops in this area was not on their map. And uh, I assumed that was an oversight on their part, but it was deliberate because, as they told me, it didn't fit with the demographic that they were marketing to. And, and it works both ways. So uh, the food hub that the community forum runs on a Saturday morning, um, I asked uh, the first 25 people in the queue one morning whether they'd heard of AstraZeneca, Arm or Abcam as three of the biggest tech companies in Cambridge. Um, there, there was a reason for asking them. I was, I was doing a, another panel session. Um, and of those 25, 17 said that they'd heard of AstraZeneca, but that was all in relation to uh, the COVID vaccination program. They didn't know that AstraZeneca were in Cambridge. Six of them knew about ARM, but that was because they drove past it. They didn't know what happened there. Not one of the 25 had heard of ABCAM. And someone asked me if it was a taxi company. So there really are these two completely separate worlds occupying a very um, small space. And uh, there's different ways of, of flagging that up. And I'll, I'll just nip through some of them here. So there's a cluster of properties owned by Cambridge City Council in this particular part of the ward. Um, very disproportionate to anything it owns anything anywhere else. Uh, and that means that there's, you know, it's visibly different. It's an estate that was built in the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, and even at that point, it was acknowledged to have a, a kind of shortfall in community facilities. And I'll, I'll come back to why that's important later. Um, it's in the middle of a food desert, I guess, uh, because it was the, the ward was originally a dormitory, we don't have supermarkets uh, of the kind which would be attractive to low income households. They're all a minimum of two miles away and they're not very accessible by public transport. Similarly, we have one cafe and one pub in the ward for 12,000 people. So this is not an area which is rich uh, in any kind of social infrastructure um, and as we heard in some of the earlier presentations finding places for people to get together build trust build community is very important and it's extremely difficult to, to help that happen here in, in relation to the the council housing i think also there's a point about how the nature of who is occupying council housing is changing over time because it's a scarce resource uh, people getting tenancies now tend to have higher needs than they would have done once upon a time. 
and the people who have tenancies are tending to age in place and so their needs increase as they grow older. Um, so when you have a concentration of the kind we have in this location, that, that tends to build quite a, quite a concentration of needs in, in the one location. Um, if you look at the census data, I, I've spent far too much time looking at the, the 2021 census data and the mapping that's available there. Um, what I think it does is again point out how anomalous this area is. I've picked one measure here, which is the, the number of people who have a degree. As you can see, 22% of the population compared to 60% average across the ward as a whole and 56% for the city. Um, and, you know, I could have chosen lots of other measures. They would all have indicated the same way. And they also flag two things about this. What, one is the level of transience here. So 17% of residents lived at a different address one year before the 21 census. So a huge churn in population and also very diverse. So 52% um, of the population born in the UK, 54% say they identify as having a UK only identity and 37% say they identify purely as having a non-UK identity. So I hope that gives you some sense of what a, a kind of melting pot this is. Um, and what's happening, and I, I felt this instinctively, and I'm very glad to see the data uh, supports it, is that this, this gap is opening over time. So if you look at the change in the indices of multiple deprivation, um, area A, the, the area we're talking about, is not as deprived as other places in the city per se. Uh, it was in the 50th centile, it's dropped to the 40th centile, but the point is, it's getting worse. Its ranking is, is deteriorating. Whereas for area B, which is the affluent part of the ward, its ranking has improved. It is now even more affluent than it was. And I think you get that sense of the place um, changing and, and these fault lines becoming more entrenched. And, and the fact that the rising tide, which the, the Cambridge phenomenon and, and the high tech narrative is, is supposed to um, indicate, it's not floating all boats. And uh, I went to the Citizens Advice Bureau and, you know, obviously this is, again, confirming the same pattern. There is a particular hotspot of contact for them in this location. So, so that, for me, is evidence of there being a, a particular concentration of need. Um, Obviously, the, the counterpart to the data is the human experience. And what I've done is talk to three households who I knew very well because they've attended the food hub over the last couple of years. Um, and the, the thing I'd like to emphasize in this is that their histories, the things I talk about that, that are part of their stories, the mental and physical health concerns, addiction, homelessness, and all the rest of it, um, that makes them look vulnerable but they are incredibly resourceful, incredibly knowledgeable about their finances. And they wanted to take part in this because they want to be heard and they want to help others by raising this issue. So there's a set of very consistent themes that came out of discussions with them. And, you know, a lot of these are very obvious. But it's it's the detail, you know, someone who couldn't access NHS dentistry, who is in so much pain with their teeth, they gave up their job because they couldn't cope with the pain and working. Someone with fibromyalgia who is in a council house would like their front door replacing. Council won't do it. The resident doesn't have the money to do it. She is now dealing with more pain and higher heating bills as a result of that. If she had, if she weren't in a place of financial hardship herself, that is an action she would absolutely be undertaking to, to make her situation better, but she can't. Um, 
one resident who drove in a bus lane picked up a £70 fine because she was also struggling with mental health problems. She left it. It turned into a £750 uh, fee being pursued by a debt management company. The same amount of money went back to the county council. There was no gain for the county council in pursuing this debt. The debt all went to the private debt collector. The proceeds all went to the private debt collector. For her to find seven hundred and fifty pounds um, is is unimaginably difficult, and it's it's the kind of situation where you see this multiplier playing out. Um, and it's it's almost painful to to see needs that people in the immediate population around this this neighborhood would be very able to 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 address privately time and again being things that that lead to this group feeling judged and feeling impotent and feeling it's impossible to build for and invest in their future. Um, there's a, a long quote here. Uh, I hope this when when this uh, material goes up online, people will be able to take the time to read it because this is the statement of someone who needed a 200 pound repair to a pipe in their house and the housing association has been obstructive for two years over that they have lost everything and when i say they've lost everything they've not just lost money but they've lost a huge amount of sentimental um material as well and to to feel like your home is a prison for the want of £200 is a really terrible thing. Similarly, I talk to service providers in the area. The, the state doesn't have much of a presence in Queen Edith. What we have is a primary school and um, a medical practice. The practitioners there talk very much about um, being required to take on externalities, interestingly, not just from other resource constraints, public services, but also from the thriving Cambridge economy. So two examples of that are the huge number of children who move to the area without English and schools are then required to pay for English tuition for these children. It's not funded by the county council anymore. It comes out of the school's own budget. And similarly, the medical practice is talking about the, the level of isolation that, that people bring to them because of the transience in the area. There's a big reliance on community groups to try and fill in, but those groups are fragile themselves and are now being asked to provide essentials where once they would have provided nice to haves, uh, both uh, school and GP practice talked about the spatial barriers of accessing, uh, you know, various types of infrastructure that would make people's lives better. If you can't afford the bus there to town, your children are going to miss out on a whole raft of um, possible experiences. Uh, they talk about the bureaucratic load and they talk about their own burnout. And I think that's a cost which doesn't get enough recognition that, that the people doing the rationing can find this as hard as the people being rationed. So the policy response to this uh, is difficult because as we've heard at length today, uh, austerity means that city councils, local authorities have less money to play with. And you can see the statement about the strains on the city council's budget on the right hand side there. Um, what the city council has done over the last 10 years is uh, develop an anti-poverty strategy, which is ward based. And this is really the point of what I'm wanting to raise today that a ward-based strategy is at best partially successful and actually can work to the detriment of people at disadvantage in wards which are not identified as a whole as being needy places. So not only does the council 
concentrate its own resources in these are in these wards. Um, it also encourages uh, implicitly other organizations to take the same response. So you try to talk to cultural organizations to bring activities down to the south and they say, we only work in the north of the city. There is a problem with building voluntary capacity down here, which means that groups don't even take advantage of the grant funding that the council can make available down here. So there's, there's, there is a, a sort of ostensible rationality to what's going on, but in terms of how it plays out on the ground, it means that people in need are missing out. And just to conclude, this is my attempt at, at constructing some sort of alternative which might lead to a virtuous circle. So there is research which... Uh, points out very clearly the shortcomings of area-based metrics. And I think acknowledging the um, flaws in a, a broad brush ward-based approach would be really helpful to the people I'm talking about. That would enable us to move behind this kind of spatial poverty shorthand, um, which is it leads people to say, oh, we do work in Abbey, we do work in Arbury, and uh, think that does the job. Um, I think if we did that, and we also promoted a more even distribution of services and facilities across the city, then we would be able to incorporate the lived experience of, of the people who, who are missing out at the moment, and that would enrich our evidence base about why they are um, su suffering this double disadvantage. And I would hope that that would, over time, produce more equitable and more um, efficacious investment approaches for, for the city. So thank you. I'm afraid I've overrun a little, but I, I hope there was some merit to what I just said. Thank you for that presentation. I think we'll really be looking forward to discussing it uh, once we get to the question period. Um, obviously, now I'll turn it over to Elise, who will be uh, presenting um, from mutual help to the institutionalization of social insurance, the case of the Swedish Insur Insurance Agency from 1850 to 2020. Thank you very much. So I will try to share my screen. And thank you for um, letting me present my, my research today. Um, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm a historian, so maybe my perspective is a little bit different, but I will spare you the, the too much history for today. And I will focus on um, on a very short period that I'm, I'm working on. In fact, this work is, is part uh, of a much bigger project on the moral economy um, that is funded by Handelsbanken in Sweden. Um, and in this project, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the history of mutual arrangement and safety nets from the Middle Ages up to now. So obviously, I'm not going to talk about the Middle Ages today. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the period uh, 2010 and, and 2020. Um, Sweden is often pictured as well, the perfect welfare state regime, uh, social democracy had um, has granted citizens extensive rights and benefits. Um, and I think when we talk about welfare state regime, um, Sweden is uh, often regarded as um, what what the best example, what what is best um, uh, best practices. And yet, over the recent years, we observe cracks in this model and, and things are not so smooth and are not working so efficiently anymore. And so I argue that there is a, um, a lot of things that have changed in the Swedish model. Uh, I'm interested in, in uh, the long term perspective, obviously. Um, and my questions regard how and why did the, the Swedish model change? And more importantly, perhaps for our purpose with this workshop um, is the question of what are the implications for the citizen? So I'm looking at the social insurance agency. It's called Forsakenkassen in Swedish. 
Um, so basically it takes care of a lot of things, but mostly um, the sick leave benefits. Um, so when people are sick, they apply to get um, sick leave benefits and the state um, provides them uh, with the money. Uh, but recently, the Swedish state um, aimed to reduce the number of benefits distributed in politics of cost reduction and state disengagement. Um, and so a lot of people have been denied those benefits. Uh, so that's what interests me today. Um, I'm looking at uh, various sources in a mixed method approach. So I'm looking at the Foshakling cast and official statistics. Well, they publish a lot of things. Um, there are not always clear statistics. Um, and I, I believe it's because they don't want people to look too closely at what's going on. Uh, I'm also looking at something called Et Undra Sexton Am uh, It's a website that collects, uh, it's a database that collects short stories of people who've been denied benefits. Uh, right now, that website has 600 short stories. Um, but every day there, there are more coming. I'm also looking at fix Facebook uh, groups. Um, they are very useful. So the for Chakrin, Krasen, Upropret. Um, that one has been created in uh, 2019. Um, I joined the group uh, in 2019 where there were 5,000 members. Uh, today, that group has 70,000 members, which is huge. You have to remember that Sweden is a very small country of 10 million inhabitants. So that, that gives you some, some, some proportion. Uh, on that website, you have about 1,342 personal stories, and you have a lot of uh, other stuff as well. I've conducted pilot uh, interviews, uh, which have been um, uh, very fruitful and rich. Um, I'm waiting for the next interviews because I need ethical clearance from the state uh, and that is taking a little while. So I would like to, to start with an example. Uh, I would like to, to, to tell you the story of a young and dynamic editor who lives in Stockholm in 2017. Uh, I'm going to call her Victoria. That's not a real a real name, um, but um, let's say her name is Victoria. So in 2017, Victoria experienced burnout symptoms. Uh, she went to the doctor. Um, she was worried about what was going on. Uh, she felt very tired. She had migraine all the time. The doctor ordered blood test, and the blood test did not reveal anything. This is very important for our story, so remember that. So Victoria went on and continued working. And she had, after all, a lot of very important deadlines. She loved her job. So she felt that she could perhaps take a few vacation, a few days off, and, and see how things uh, would improve. Two years later, in 2019, she consulted the doctor again. Um, her symptoms had only gotten worse. She could not perform her work any longer. She had to wear sunglasses in front of her computer. She could not stand noise anymore. Her heart was beating irregularly and she couldn't train at the gym or she could not socialize with a friend anymore. Um, she was exhausted all the time on the verge of total collapse. She did not have energy to cook. She didn't have energy to shop groceries or even to take a shower. So she went to bed after work uh, right away at 6.30 every day, completely exhausted. The doctor ordered a blood test again. The blood test did not show anything. But because she was exhausted and because she told her story to the doctor, he decided to put her on 100% sick leave. So she was on, on sick leave for uh, a little while. She tried to recover. She joined a, a program, a rehab program for stressed uh, people with um, burnout syndromes. So everything was going well. But after um, six months, which is 180 days, Poshaklin Kassan, the social agency, contacted her, uh, sent her a letter and said, well, uh, after uh, your sick leave for 180 days, the rules are such that you are only entitled to sickness benefit if you are unable 
to do any work that is normally done in the labor market. Uh, it's a little bit of, uh, it's my translation that I might be a little bit complicated to understand, but it's very complicated in Swedish. Um, it means that after six months, if she could not work at a regular job, well, she, uh, Social King Kassan had to make an assessment if she could work at all. And they decided that yes, despite the burnout, she could work and do something else. Uh, something that was less demanding, um, something that did not place high demands on her ability, for instance, or where she could take regular breaks. Um, and so she was denied benefits. In order to keep her uh, sickness benefits, she had to register as a, an employment agency, meaning that she had to find something else uh, because Fosha Kinkasan considered that she could work 100% elsewhere. Uh, she had actually started rehab, so she was already working 25%. The stress rehab was made, um, it was um, um, something that she decided with her employer. So the employer went to the meeting with the doctor, they designed a plan and a strategy for her to start working again. And so for Shakin Kassan, uh, the for Shakin Kassan caseworker um, judge her doctor certificate and the rehab plan she's made uh, irrelevant to the decision that didn't count. And what is very important here is that those case workers for Chakin Kassan, they have no medical expertise whatsoever. Um, and so the medical certificate has basically no value in that, in that case. Um, just like Victoria, a growing number of Swedes were denied sickness benefits after 180 days. Between 2010 and 2015, as you can see on the graph, about 5% of the application for benefits were rejected. Between 2016 and 2020, the proportion kept increasing to reach 30% of rejection in 2020, the year Victoria's application was denied. Um, I don't see... Yeah, on the graph, you, see you have 21 that doesn't really count because uh, that was COVID year. Uh, so the statistic might be wrong. And 22, we only have one uh, trimester um, in the system. Um, but you see the trend between uh, uh, 15 and 20 are it's just going up. Um, and maybe what is the most uh, telling is uh, the number of cases rejected if we divide by sex, you see that between 2010 and 2014 is basically the gap between men and women is not so wide. Uh, more women um, cases rejected, but marginally, I think it, it, the difference is, is, is quite reduced. And then it increased tremendously, uh, the gap between those rejections increased. I'm going to, to talk about that uh, just in the, in, the, in the second, if you can hold on. So what happened and, and what's what's going on? I'm not going to talk about um, you know, all the political development in those last years, but th there is definitely a political concern regarding the growing cost of sickness benefits in Sweden, um, mostly be under the influence of neoliberal ideas, um, but also perhaps in the Swedish context, something that has to do with culture, the culture of individualism. I think perhaps you know that Sweden is the most individualist country in uh, the world where people are supposed to do things by themselves. Um, everything is individualized, your, your tax return, for instance. Um, so there, there is this, this idea that, uh, of independence. And there is this idea in a Protestant country that work is very important. Uh, I think the combination of all of this uh, make politicians look at um, those numbers uh, with great horror. And there's been an official report in 2015 that state that sickness benefits rate has increased by almost 70%, while expenditure on sickness benefit increased by 12 million billion uh, Swedish kroner between 2010 and 2014, this is a serious trend that must be stopped. And they did, in, in fact, do something about it. Um, so they've designed uh, a plan with uh, seven measures, um, basically empty measures. Uh, one measure was to increase gender equality at the workplace. I mean, in order to do that, you have to involve 
you know, employers, companies, and so on. You have to have a plan. Uh, but there was there was nothing like that. It was it was just politician talks somehow. But they did have another idea. They assigned Rochak in Kassan not to pay more um, than nine days of sickness on average a year per person instead of 10 previously. It means that the average number of newly granted sickness benefits should not exceed about 18,000 per year. Um, and, and so, in effect, it means Shokashin Kassan has received a mission uh, with a quota. And um, they took this mission at heart. And they could do that because um, of the number of rules that we have in Sweden. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but basically, case workers had to assess if uh, there was an objective evidence in the doctor certificate supporting the, the doctor uh, assessment. So obviously, when you have burnout syndrome, there is nothing on your blood test. And so for Jacqueline Kassan, case workers use that to deny benefits to people like Victoria because there was no objective evidence. But how can you actually demonstrate you have burnout syndrome? Um, and so most people after 180 days who have been denied benefits, been people struggling with mental, mental health, um, especially uh, stress-related syndromes and burnout syndromes, uh, as well as depression. Um, so doctors had uh, often to resubmit uh, the application, uh, something they call uh, completering, for, to, to complete the application with objective evidence. And obviously, since blood tests cannot show um, um, burnout syndrome, that has been very, very complicated. I've been talking to a few doctors and they were very, very pissed because uh, it adds to their workload um, and they were sad to see that people are denied benefits. It's not, it's not good for the health of the people. Um, well, Tvorshak and Kassan has used also something called the DFR, Kadian, which, which basically is a Swedish term that means it's a checklist uh, for case workers to assess the doctor's certificate. Uh, it doesn't work very well because the doctor is not aware of this and the patient doesn't know either about this. So it's something that Fosha and Kassan have been using on their own. Um, they've been denying, um, uh, as I said, a lot of um, application after 180 days because they consider that people had to go back to work after 180 days. Um, they often send the rejection letter or the rejection email on a Friday afternoon. So people try to call and reach the caseworker. Uh, they couldn't do that. So they had to wait until the Monday. Uh, a few caseworkers have told me that this strategy uh, was something that they did uh, on purpose because they didn't want people uh, being too angry on the phone. So obviously, when we've been talking about personal hardship, uh, this politics of um, um, cutting costs had a lot of uh, um, effect on, on people. One effect, obviously, is a money problem. And here you have a quote from Jessica. Um, we've been uh, talking about her, uh, her problem. It's usually the problem are not just the money problem. It also, it implies also the health problem, the family problems. Um, a rejection means a, a, a huge bundle of problems. Um, so people struggle uh, on many fronts. And the money problem is obviously a very big one because in a country with a low rate of marriage, um, with a high number of people living alone, um, and meaning there is no two salaries in the household, it can be very complicated. So on the database I've been looking at, uh, uh, I took a hundred and cases and I look at how they actually, um, what were their source of income after rejection? Um, it's uh, mostly for women, it's the support of their family, their spouse or their partner. So they became even more dependent uh, on the people that they are living with. Um, there is a high rate of mixed solution and it's really like a strategy survival here um, because the mixed solution are uh, loaned from family members. Um, it's using their savings. Um, some people have been saving for retirement so they've been using that. Um, it's also selling things um, and yeah, so it's it's different kind of strategies. 
Uh, family problem, of course, it doesn't just affect the person whose application has been rejected, but also uh, the entire family, including children. Uh, some people who struggle financially, they also feel like they are not uh, there for the children. And uh, um, this one say, for instance, that uh, she's the cause of the problem. She feels powerless, cannot do anything. So there is also a lot of shame at attached to this. And obviously, the health problem has been very important. Uh, a lot of people have been reported not to feel any better. And because most people whose application has been rejected have been struggling with mental health, um, burnout, burnout um, symptoms, depression, anxiety, and the like, um, their symptoms actually have gotten even worse. Um, their worsened condition uh, it has even triggered depression and anxiety and uh, sleep deprivation in, in a lot of people who have been um, dealing with, with this problem. Um, I found a few suicide cases that I cannot verify at the moment. Uh, there are a few stories on the Facebook group uh, of uh, a couple of young women who committed suicide, um, who, according to their family, has been, been committing suicide on, because of, uh, of the rejection and the loss of income. So there's been some collective action. There have been uh, media started to report on this problem in starting in 2017 and 2018. Is, is, there is a few articles here and there in the media. Um, it hasn't been a lot of public attention. It's been recently a documentary on the main uh, Swedish uh, television channel. Um, but except for that, there hasn't been really like any um, any effects. And Swedes being Swedes, um, the demonstrations they've been doing, it's actually to light candles in front of Fasha Kinkasan in November um, in order to protest. So we're very far from the French uh, setting things on fire in the streets. Um, so perhaps a, a little bit more could, could help in, in this situation. Um, so just like to, to conclude, and I don't know how much time I have, probably not. Um, I, I just, um, my aim here is to, to talk about, um, to develop some theory around institutional betrayal, about this broken contract between the citizen and the state, because um, the contract was not searched and it's been broken by one party who changed the terms of the contract. Uh, and I think this is very, um, very important. Um, one thing to focus in particular is perhaps to ask the question if female workers are being are being betrayed in this, uh, because they are the one uh, being affected the most by, by this situation. Um, well, it's no secret that Sweden has the highest level of social protection expenditure in relation to GDP uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. Um, I don't know how it is in the UK when you report on Sweden, but the French are um, uh, so in love with Swindon and there's been like a lot of articles lately or even um, shows and documentaries uh, since uh, Emmanuel Macron has been elected actually. Uh, they, 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 they would like to, to try the Swedish model, but the Swedish model doesn't, doesn't work so well. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for that presentation and um, I think as much as we can certainly get into it later on in the discussion, it's always important to have a historical perspective in these kinds of questions and, and discussions just because of the, the long-term effects um, and the long-term development of some of these problems. It's very easy to imagine that they begin in 2008 or at about 2010, and in actual fact, there's an interesting development. Um, so I'm very glad to have such a perspective. Uh, and we will now move on to our last panelist, Addison, uh, just before uh, we open up to discussion and questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just load up my presentation here. So thank you so much to the fellow panelists. I'm just going to jump right into housing from a social harms perspective. So to start off, this is the residential housing price in Windsor over the last 10 years. You've been hearing a little bit about Windsor in this uh, conference. And so in this presentation, you're gonna get to hear from Windsorites a little bit. So I'm focused on the part outlined in green here or by the little arrow underneath. I interviewed successful and unsuccessful home buyers who were in the market during these years between 2019 and just the start of 2022. 
the time when I conducted my interviews was right here in this red circle, just at the very tip of this short and quite uh, dramatic rise in home prices that had been building up over the previous years. And that fall to the right hadn't happened yet. So given this rise, I ask in my research, what are the social consequences of rising home prices? So to begin, let's just zoom out a little bit to just after the Allied victory in World War II. During this time, you have a deliberate push among Canadian housing policymakers to make homeownership more affordable to Canadians and to encourage homeownership among Canadians. They had hundreds of thousands of returning veterans and a need to stimulate an economy in the post-war time. And it's during this time that the Canadian dream of timely and reliable homeownership, this notion that at a certain stage in life, when you start a family, when you meet your spouse, you will become a homeowner, is born and becomes culturally ingrained. And this paper, this research really focuses on this dream. And during this time, it's actually quite attainable. Um, there's changes to the Housing Act and the Bank Act, which make it so that mortgages are more available to Canadians. Um, it's made so that banks can offer mortgages aside from just the government agencies, and the terms of these mortgages expand during these years. And what results during this time is this little flow chart I outlined here, where you have this dream, this cultural ideal of attaining a home at a certain stage in life, and that positively influences the overall economy, right? Folks are buying homes, this stimulates the post-war economy. Now, in these economic arrangements in the post-war years, this has a positive influence on housing affordability, again, because of these changes that are being made to policy to make mortgages more attainable. And all three of those factors have the result of making the dream actually attainable. So what you have is a positive feedback loop where this culturally ingrained notion of the Canadian dream becomes fairly attainable at this time. Uh, but things change as we move into uh, neoliberalism in the 1970s. And I'll give brief notes because we've explored this in detail in this conference. Um, during this time, the government's back out of their involved role in housing and also in social welfare provision. Right? There's less dedicated funding to affordable housing and dedicated rental housing. But at the same time, there are tax benefits introduced to homeownership. For example, the policy of no capital gains on the sale of principal residence, whereby if you buy a home and its value increases, and then you sell that home, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax on the money that you realize from the home's increased equity, right? So in the absence of social provisions, right, as governments have stepped back from that role, you have homeownership enter as a form of privatized welfare, right? You know, privatized welfare only makes sense in the context of rising home prices, whereby if your home increases in value, you can sell it when you retire in the absence of a social pension for a little bit of retirement pension uh, that isn't uh, taxed as capital gains. But if that's the logic, then homes also become attractive to investors generally who want to grow their money. So in a neoliberal context, the home becomes this very uh, well-functioning, wealth-generating tool becomes quite attractive to individuals and to investors who want to grow their money. And this is the effect of creating financial barriers to home ownership, right? The home becomes this attractive wealth generating vector and home prices rise in response. And so just to amend the flowchart that I showed previously, you can see it's still there on the left, that positive feedback loop I just identified under the post-war economy. You can see I've branched it on the right-hand side to show that under neoliberal capitalism, the dynamics change slightly. And I'll follow it from the middle top down to the right-hand side here you still have this cultural idea of homeownership at a certain stage in life, this dream, and that positively influences the overall economy. People want to buy homes, people want to reprivatize welfare and grow their investments. But under neoliberal capitalism, the benefits to homeownership are so outsized that that has a negative effect on housing affordability. Financial barriers rise to actually attaining a home. And then if we follow the right arc, you can see that negatively influences the attainability of the dream. Right, financial barriers arise, and the chance that you'll actually achieve that homeownership at that stage in life is reduced. So let's talk a little bit about how I frame this whole background conceptually for my research. I'll start by outlining two models of housing behavior in the housing studies literature, and that's the life cycle and the life course model. The life cycle model, model posits this linear progression that at a certain stage in life, when you start a family, when you meet your spouse, you become a homeowner. It was developed in the 1950s, and you could see it's precisely what I just described as the Canadian dream. The life course model emerged in the 80s and the 90s by scholars who critiqued the life cycle model, saying, well, housing isn't always this linear progression. You could go on renting forever, or you could rent and then buy a home, sell it a couple of years later to reap capital gains, and then be a renter for a long period of time. And this is more reflective of the environment that I just described under neoliberal capitalism, where 
you could endeavor to buy a home, but find that there are financial barriers and go on renting uh, or reap those capital gains in a short term and go on renting after that. It's more reflective of that environment. The second bit of concepts that I introduced in this paper uh, relates to criminology and housing. This is a criminology master's thesis. And so I have to uh, connect criminological literature in some way. Uh, but this is a little challenging because in orthodox criminology, um, the research identifies the social benefits of housing, right? These scholars talk a lot about how um, home ownership is conducive to social cohesion among neighbors or individual well-being, but those established concepts are always connected in some way to crime, right? The social cohesion among neighborhood is good because it reduces deviance or because it reduces victimization of crime. So this is useful for establishing the social benefits of housing uh, because they have to draw on that, but it's not so helpful for me because nothing that I'm studying here is illegal. Uh, so that's when the social harms perspective comes in handy, this perspective in criminology, which studies phenomena that are not illegal, but are nonetheless injurious to individuals in the social body. And social harm is divided into four main categories. You have physical harm, psychological harm, um, financial harm, which are all fairly self-explanatory. Then you have threats to cultural safety, where cultural safety is defined as uh, notions of autonomy, development, and growth. So where any of these are threatened, we have threats to cultural safety as a category of social harm. Now, I argue in this paper that rising home prices fit the spill of threats to cultural safety. In the realm of housing and harms, scholars in the past have really focused on the physical dimension, right? They'll study people's experiences in homes that fit the legal standard for uh, habitable housing, but are nonetheless plagued by things like mold or the presence of asbestos or just being too cramped overall. Um, but recently, scholars have looked more broadly at the political economy surrounding housing, right? The ideological dimensions that I sort of intimated when talking about the dream and how those are conducive to social harm. And I focus in my piece on uh, a work in 2021 by Mark Shellhays from King's College London, where he argues that the ideological privileging of homeownership in the UK, whereby homeownership is presented as the form of housing tenure and the benefits conferred to that in policy reflect that, is conducive to all four of the type of harms that I have outlined here, right? So his discussion of cultural harms or threats to cultural safety rather is what I'm interested in here. His argument is premised on a mismatch between the life cycle model and the life force model. Um, folks in the UK, he argues, uh, have this happy home ownership narrative where they assume that if they attain a home, they have secured their private pension and that will carry them into a national retirement, the life cycle model. But what they find, and this is where he identifies threats to cultural safety, is that home ownership is so desirable that they will often not be able to attain that and so lose out on this promise, this happy home ownership narrative, and still experience harm in this category. In other words, the rising prices threaten their autonomy and their ability to choose where they want to live and their financial growth because they aren't able to achieve that privatized pension. Now, Shelhays in his work is fairly brief on threats to cultural safety. Uh, what he intimates, but doesn't actually name, is the presence of relative deprivation. Now, Relative deprivation is defined as the excess of expectations over the opportunity or ability to achieve it, right? Unsuccessful home buyers are by no means completely deprived of autonomy or of the ability to develop or to grow financially, but relative to homeowners, they are in the context when homes uh, occupy such a key role, they are relatively deprived compared to homeowners rather than absolutely deprived, right? So in this piece here, I build on Shellhays' work he speaks about the applicability of this category quite generally. I endeavor to back that up with interview data and also to add a little bit of meat to his discussion by focusing on relative deprivation and specifics. So to sum up the conceptual framework, we have that two armed diagram that I showed you before. The only change that's been made here is on the right hand side, whereby if you'll recall, financial barriers arise to home ownership, negative effect on housing affordability. I argue that that negative relationship leads to feelings of relative deprivation, and that those feelings of relative deprivation constitute social harm on the grounds of threats to cultural safety. So let's move into the methods of this study. Based on all that I've just spoke of, I hypothesize that the social consequences of rising prices are harmful and that that harm is mediated by feelings of relative deprivation. I interviewed 16 individuals for this project, 
uh, eight unsuccessful home buyers and eight successful home buyers. But don't worry so much about the bottom column now. I'll return to that in a moment. I coded these interviews for themes and condensed them down to three main themes, which I'll go over right now. The first is an environment of asset speculation, the first theme. And here participants discuss that large rise in a short period of time that you saw on the graph at the beginning. And they talk about how this rise was driven mostly by investors and less so by an actual increase in the value of those homes, the underlying value of those homes. And here I'll let the participants speak for themselves. There's no money coming into the market that justifies the increase in prices. People are buying on their buying power with low interest rates and they're buying on the speculation that 10 years from now, this house will be worth this much. And you can do that with real estate to a certain degree because you tend not to move. So this category of analysis, it's useful for reflecting everything that I just laid out in the introduction, but it's not conducive to harm in any real way. So we'll move on to the next theme that I analyzed, which is barriers to inclusion. So the unsuccessful home buyers that I spoke with uniformly reported financial barriers to inclusion in home ownership. Of course, they wanted to buy a home, tried, but didn't have enough money to do so. Here, I'll let the participants talk a little bit about that. For example, we'd go see a house that was listed at $199,000 and would be like, oh yeah, do you think this is a competitive offer? And the real estate agent would say, well, if you're not going to put a three in front of that, then you're not going to get it. So we were just like, okay, well, it's just absurd. It's basically a bidding war. So that's kind of why we decided just to stick with renting this year. So what participants like Jeremy and others would go on to describe is concerns over their own financial growth potential from not buying a home and also of their children's financial growth potential. Um, and what we see here is the presence of relative deprivation of financial growth. Um, now, this could indicate financial harm. But I just I don't have enough data in my research to assert that I didn't ask for their financial details or track it over time. So let's move on to the final theme. And that's homeownership and lifestyle. So here participants articulated the Canadian dream, right? That linear progression that I mentioned where at a certain point in life, you'll attain a home when you start a family, when you meet your spouse. But they articulated this dream as a guiding framework for their own life progression. Right. So it wasn't just that financial barriers prevented these uh, participants from attaining that uh, financial growth that the previous theme had mentioned, it also blocked what they believed to be a standard life trajectory, trajectory and a trajectory that they had set for their own lives. And I'll let the participants speak on this again. I just bought my first home last year and it's just kind of a starter house essentially. So I guess I felt embarrassment in that sense too. The fact that any time anyone asked me in the past year, oh, you gonna buy a house? Or I saw friends buying homes and I'm still waiting. It was just embarrassing. So Mindy managed to buy a home, but what she speaks on here are feelings that my other unsuccessful buyers would also co-sign on and would go on feeling not having attained that home in the end like she did. What the participants reflect here is, as I mentioned earlier, this lack of autonomy to choose their form of housing tenure. They all wanted to buy a home, but were blocked in their ability to do so by these financial barriers to attaining it. They also express this disconnect socially that Mindy talks about a little bit here, where their peers had perceptively progressed to this new stage in life where they had fulfilled this dream and they were left behind. So there was that social development disconnect there. Now, the key here is that this lack of autonomy, this disconnect in social development and this um, you know, comparatively less financial growth was all articulated by participants relative to successful buyers. They were all able to make decisions themselves and they all had friend groups and they all, they all had jobs, but they all felt that relative to people who owned a home, they were relatively deprived of all three of these things. And these are the categories of cultural harm, threats to cultural safety rather, that I outlined earlier. Now, an unexpected theme also emerged here, which was negative mental health outcomes that can come from being an unsuccessful buyer. Um, particularly in the realm of failing to achieve this dream, this cultural ideal. Um, outside of the money that participants would lose out on, they felt embarrassed, as Mindy said, and also depressed because they failed to achieve this dream. So in conclusion, what I can say with this data is that the social consequences of rising housing prices uh, are harmful and that that harm is mediated by feelings of relative deprivation. Um, the interview data show that as harm as threats to cultural safety is a consequence of rising home prices and that rise, right, rising home prices form a financial barrier that prevent attainment of the dream 
And this leaves unsuccessful buyers feeling relatively deprived of the autonomy to choose their tenure, the social development where they would pace their peers along this uh, life progression, and the financial growth that is attached to home ownership. This point I jumped ahead on, it was the thesis saying that rising prices are conducive to harm, and those harms are feel mediated by feelings of relative deprivation. That's what the data show. So what we get from this research is it adds uh, some empirical evidence to Shell Hayes's assertion that the rising price environment uh, was conducive to social harm in the category of uh, threats to cultural safety. And it also adds that little component of relative deprivation, which he didn't name, but which fits very well with the experiences of my participants. Um, now, it's important to note here that not all participants felt relatively deprived, right? Not all of the people who failed to buy a home felt relatively deprived of the categories that I mentioned that homeowners had attained. You can see on the bottom column here, starting on the left, two of the unsuccessful buyers were relatively satisfied with not buying a home. They found that renting was better for them and decided that they were happy as things were. But the majority, six others, did feel relatively deprived in the three areas that I mentioned. And it's also crucial to note that none of the successful buyers felt relatively deprived compared to those who hadn't bought a home. And even those who would buy a home and go on to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars repairing their home, absolutely a negative financial decision, would still say that they felt relatively satisfied having bought a home compared to someone who hadn't because they had achieved that cultural ideal of that linear home ownership progression. So there's a few things that remained unexplored in this research. Um, the financial dimension, which I mentioned earlier that I didn't have the data for, and that psychological dimension of mental health that emerged from the interviews. Didn't have measures to assess that, but there's definitely something there. However, this research does give me enough, enough data to assert that rising prices are conducive to harm in the category of threats to cultural safety, and that we see that through participants articulating these feelings of relative deprivation. So thanks to my committee members for helping me produce this research and also to the friends and family watching at home, everyone who's presented on the panel and our organizer. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks everyone for those presentations. Um, obviously this keeps us nicely on track. Um, and so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, I think this panel really brings together papers on the theme of hardship in sort of prosperous contexts. Uh, what it's like to experience poverty or struggle to achieve financial success when others around you seem to have done very well, or when historically um, people in, in the same circumstances would have fared better um, with, with having needs, needs met. Um, so how do people cope when an institution which has historically served them and their interests begins to deny assistance and benefits um, that have characterized an understanding of the social contract? Um, Although the objects of study on this panel obviously diverge and the time periods um, and the places in which in which they're they're uh, studying, um, in some cases, there are really some overarching themes, I think, um, about what it means to struggle or have difficulty fulfilling economic, social and even personal expectations in geographical or social contexts where one might otherwise expect um, to find a certain amount of support. Um, or to benefit from prosperity in the area. Um, and I think one, one point that came out of Elise's uh, abstract um, was that there is then the possibility of instability related to uh, the breakdown of um, or, or the, the disintegration of a social contract. Um, and as a result, the effect of that on the democratic process itself. Um, and I think that there are elements in the papers both by Sam and Addison that point to the costs then that this disappointment can have either in the crumbling of communities um, or in the frustration of expectations about planning for the future um, and the creation of financial security for oneself. But obviously um, at this point, it would be excellent to open up to questions uh, from, from our attendees if anybody has has anything that they would like to ask? Um, so we have, admittedly, I didn't see who went first, Daniel or Mia. I think um, Daniel's first. Okay, yes, we'll turn it over to you, Daniel. By split second. <laughs> um, 
yeah thank you very much for the for the presentations um uh, i had a question for uh, sam if that's okay so um in your uh, presentation you talked about how in in sort of the the kind of blind spots that can um can emerge when there's sort of finite resources and increasingly kind of acute forms of need and forms of need that aren't always seen um or visible um either in the data or in kind of uh teams that are designing policy or prioritizing where resources should go i wondered if you could just say a little bit more about the the kind of inequalities that this can create at a uh, at a hyper local level so um i'm thinking about how sort of local charities and, and voluntary groups have to adopt and internalize some of the kind of logics um of say welfare reform or, or austerity um uh and how that kind of relates to the burnout potentially of some, both staff and volunteers so that wasn't very well uh, formulated but do, do you could you have a go at reformulating yes. it for someone who's not quite as familiar with the the technical language as as many of the people on the call will be yeah no it's it's not it's not through your lack of knowledge it's my poor word <laughs> poor wording so it's it, it's more how um so food banks, um, debt advice services, fuel poverty charities are having having to ration um, finite resources um, across communities and having to prioritise, say, hubs or services in particular areas. And I wondered if you uh, would be able to kind of reflect on, on that and the changing kind of status and role of charitable provision as a result. If that makes better sense, sorry. Yeah, no, that that makes more sense. Um, so, one of the things I am acutely aware of is how complex all of the mechanisms which have been put in place to try and buffer people from the worst um, impacts of of hardship. Uh, how very, very, very difficult to to navigate they are so i think at one point there were 42 different schemes that offered different forms of support to different client groups being uh, advertised on the city council website now how someone who's you know cold or struggling to feed their kids is also supposed to have the headspace to navigate all of that information, identify the bits that are relevant to their circumstances, and then follow through on it. Um, I don't know. And I, I think the, you know, one response to what you're making is the point you're making is where there is physical space for residents to go and talk to people about their situation that signposting process can work so much better. Um, and in our location, because we don't really have um, a, a history of that or, or places for that to happen, it's now occurring in really dysfunctional ways. So for example, the social prescriber at the medical practice has been in post for six months. She's very clear about what a social prescriber should be doing but she's not able to do it with the people she most wants to work with at the moment because she's spending all her time helping them fill in PIP forms or ESA forms or something. Um, similarly in the school, uh, you know, they've had to turn themselves into a, a kind of one-stop shop for advice simply because there's nobody else in the area doing it. So, so I think, you know, when I talked about a kind of ecosystem to help disadvantaged places cope with their disadvantage, I look quite enviously at places like Abbey Ward, 
because they do have some level of service and expertise embedded that people can turn to. And it's not a case of individuals being um, left to sort stuff out for themselves as best they can. Um, so that, that's one aspect of it. And the other is, um, so Mia will know this because she's one of our volunteers. Um, we set up a, this food hub at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, because of the, the spatial characteristics of the neighborhood, we haven't been able to go down the route, which a lot of the other food hubs have, which is taking surplus from nearby supermarkets because we don't have any nearby supermarkets. So we have had to basically rely on financial donations. It's, it's, a, um, it's a very direct pitch. We say, you are affluent people sharing a ward with people who are in hardship. Give us your money in a, in a very Geldof-esque kind of way. And miraculously, that has worked to date incredibly effectively. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've had to shamelessly, in effect, milk the inequality in the ward to, to, for, for redistributive purposes. But I think I used the word fragility in, in my presentation. It does all feel incredibly fragile, you know? Uh, it's, it's dependent on goodwill at this point and and people who come to the food hub say to me you know with considerable anxiety in their voice are you going to stay open and the answer i give them is yes absolutely for as long as we can but it doesn't come with any guarantees and if we lost volunteer capacity or financial commitments from residents then it wouldn't exist anymore so so that sense of improvisation and bootstrapping is is absolutely the characteristic of what's going on in our location at the moment thanks very much mia the floor is yours great thanks um uh, an observation for sam and a question for addison um you know what you just said there, Sam, so reminds me of some of the um, research we did on Great Yarmouth as well, and these kind of peripheral um, uh, seaside communities that are that are quite poor. And one of our respondents said at one point, well, you know, there's all sorts of issues with the um, local economy and everything, but we've got the infrastructure for the poor. And um, they were talking about um, uh, drug rehab centers, and um, they were talking about charity, not, not even branded charity shops, because they were too expensive, actually, but they could provide non-branded charity shops where, where everything was 50p, and um, uh, also a culture of acceptance where there was no stigma involved, you know, and, and all these things together. And I think, you know, your presentation is so interesting in highlighting how the difficulties of being, of really struggling financially within this context where, where there's so much affluence. Really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I had a question for Addison, which is about... Um, the ways in which there has been any pushback, I suppose, political pushback about the norms around maturing and uh, gaining a house. And, you know, we've seen various places at different points then have different norms. All of a sudden, you know, squatting becomes uh, acceptable or cool or interesting or a viable alternative, or um, when people give up the dream because actually they can see that's not kind of, um, you know, you know that, that the odds are stocked, stacked against them or something like that. 
And, you know, you mentioned at the very end, I thought that was intriguing, that, well, two people out of the eight who didn't buy actually thought that's fine and that's okay. Is that because they were pursuing an alternative or um, because they knew in a few years time they would actually be well positioned or, you know, what, what are the kind of cultural politics of it? Right. So I guess I'll start at your last point and work backwards. Uh, among those two, one, it was really just a lifestyle thing um, for this individual found, oh, well, the place I'm renting is a gym downstairs and all of this. And well, this is just great for me. And the story for the other person was precisely what you just mentioned, where they said, ah, well, we've been beaten out this time. But if my foresight's correct, then certainly housing prices are bound to come down. And it turns out they were right. Um, <laughs> as far as the cultural pushback, um, it, it, it's really just, I've, I've read a lot of news stories about individuals who will uh, say precisely what you said, which is where, well, what we're seeing doesn't really correspond to this cultural notion of, hey, at a certain point in life, I get a home. But nonetheless, it seems like folks are keen to hold on to that. Um, I don't really see any large move towards, as you said, normalizing other forms like squatting or, um, you know, multi-generational housing, although that's certainly something that's present well, in yeah. other cultures. Exactly. Um, but I, I think, and what I think makes this research uh, have legs is that, yeah, folks are, are keen to hold on to the dream, whether it works or not. Um, the question of what to do with that, whether you collectively reject it, whether you move to make it more attainable um, is, is up in the air. Both seem like they could be pursued from this research, but whether there's any action directed against it, I just don't see it. Mm, interesting. Interesting that you don't, right? That it's not visible, that it's not there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. We have about 12 minutes left, so obviously I'll wait to see if there are any more questions um, and maybe in the meantime ask one of my own to um, Aliza about uh, these sort of trends in in um, the, the changing nature of provision. I was just wondering whether whether uh, the, the denial, the increasing denial of benefits to, to applicants is sort of, whether it's accompanied um, in the way that it is in the UK by a sort of harshness of of navigating the system and whether whether that in itself becomes a huge process to to people who are already overburdened by by illness and and burnout itself and whether whether it then becomes a really opaque system for them to try and manage as as part of a way of almost managing or filtering out some of those claims oh, thank you for your question yeah so it, it's a little bit different perhaps because applying for um, sickness benefit is pretty straightforward. Uh, so the doctors send in the application, so you don't have much to do, actually. When it becomes more complicated, it's when your application got rejected. Then you have to do uh, things on your own, and then the doctor can do anything for you. Um, you can appeal the decision if you want. Um, I have to say that uh, the number of appeals have increased over the years. But the, the result remained the same because the Court of Justice uh, gave reason to Foshak and Kassan. Um, but appealing is um, a lot of respondents as have uh, emphasized that it's, it's very tiring. Um, it's a lot of um, um, hurdles on the way. You have to hire a lawyer. Um, so for people in a situation of, of burnout, uh, anxiety and de depression, it's almost uh, impossible and they give up. Uh, they don't appeal the decision and then they just try to survive somehow and try to find um, money um, and make and meet. Thanks very much for that. And I see now, uh, Ronjon Paul, uh, you have a question. Uh, comment while I manage the cat and trying to get out the door uh, shortly. Um, Just in terms of, I mean, open question, I guess, maybe for everybody here, because uh, I've been meditating on this. What's the public cost of personal hardship for a couple of weeks now, thinking about uh, thinking about the conference? Um, uh, one is uh, the question, uh, comment for Addison. Um, uh, I used to say, in epistemology 
finance and real estate, location, location, location. Um, and that having a bearing on uh, how we do our research. But some things that are um, in many respects unique to Windsor um, is you could for several generations, regardless of where you came from in the world, um, find a job and make enough to, um, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, make enough to uh, buy a house. Um, and now that, that changed in the in the 21st century may come back um, now but so that expectation of work and home ownership being built into the local culture but things being differently in a place like montreal so it's i, I see this less a question of home ownership than a question of what do people see as being suitable housing um some other things that really distort um a national perception of real estate and expectations about home ownership in Canada is the extent to which commodities markets, especially oil in particular, cause these boom bust cycles in some pretty big Canadian cities, cities Edmonton, Calgary, um, Saskatoon, Regina, so on the, on the prairies, uh, which have put the lie to the notion that, well, real estate always goes up. So if you are going to jump in early and feel like uh, you're gonna be house poor because you spent so much to get into uh, the home ownership market, um, you think, okay, I'll be okay because house prices only go up. Um, boom bust in those, in those markets uh, really distort that picture. So the numbers of people that I know um, who've had to move for various reasons, find themselves underwater, um, which is to say, owing more on their mortgage than they were able to sell their house for it is, is quite um, significant. There'd be multiple cycles of that. Um, plus, um, there was a very significant recession in, um, in Canada, it hit, hit Ontario um, very hard, um, 1990, 1991, where we saw a, a big real estate bubble burst um, and house prices really didn't recover for the better part of a, a decade. Now, the extent to which that affects people's expectations about homeownership, I'm not sure we really know, or questions about uh, housing, I'm not really sure we know. Um, so that's a, a comment for Addison, maybe others as well, working on housing. Um, and then uh, just finally, a, a, a final reflection. Um, I think there's a broader public cost to not having a broader conversation about personal hardship. Um, things are hard, things are hard for a lot of people. There are a lot of challenges, struggles for a lot of people at a lot of different stages in the life course. Um, if there's one major ideological consequence of neoliberalism, it, maybe it is that we don't have an open public conversation about personal hardship. We, we see the worst of it at the acute end, um, and some of this I like to describe, being a sociologist, the psychological industrial complex, where when it's at a really acute phase, okay, then the government's willing to um, uh, find some money to, to um, provide people with acute um, psychological services. Um, but the absence of that broader conversation, that life is difficult for many people at many stages in life, of course, in the ostensibly, well, they are rich countries of, of the global north. Um, and I, I, I can't help but think that this is a significant public cost, something that um, affects our social health. health. And it means that um, I think some little, little wins, I, I don't know how else to put it, um, about uh, making it easier for people to enjoy social life, to enjoy being a social person in your, in your milieu, in your neighborhood, get lost. Um, I look at my own neighborhood, it's uh, rapidly gentrifying, um, it's a trendy spot to live, et cetera. Um, but the lack of concern for the maybe two thirds of households in the area that really can't afford the nice bars, the restaurants, the, uh, the, the artistic events. Um, and there's really no, um, not, uh, there's no zero cost, public facility readily available to them. No community center, no public library, um, uh, very little way in the way of uh, fitness or wellness facilities that are just 
free to use, including just a nice patio where people can sit with their neighbors and not have to spend money. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciated uh, hearing uh, people's thoughts uh, over the past couple of days about, yeah, there is this public cost of personal hardship and maybe we need to push a broader conversation that life is hard for a lot of people. Thanks. Thank you for summing that up so well. Um, obviously it's really helpful. It's a really helpful summation I think to have at the end of this panel. Um, uh, Addison, did you want to did you want to reflect on um, any of those comments? Sure thing. Um, I think the the locational differences is super important and very, very valuable. Um, what I hope to do with this research is is branch it out to where I can look at those different locations. And it would be excellent to find that, for example, in those areas where there's a boom and bust like that, there isn't a corresponding, you know, reflection of this, you know, dream ideology. Uh, I think that would be very valuable to the research that I have, just as a countervailing example, too. Um, that was that was my thought on that. Thank you. Neve, can I chip in with just a, a quick response to yes, that? Yes, please. Um, so, as, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, you know, the whole pitch around Cambridge and particularly this bit of Cambridge is that it is a uh, global knowledge centre and that people who move here from all over the world are the absolute creme de la creme in their field. And I often think about how that makes you feel if you don't identify with those labels quite the opposite if you're not global are you parochial if hmm. you're not a knowledge worker are you ignorant um and one of the the books that i've read that's really sort of sharpened my thinking on this is is michael sandal's meritocracy because i think so much of the narrative about what's going on is about, well, we've made it because we worked hard and we're, you know, we, we, we have made this, uh, made a success of ourselves. And when you look at the structural barriers to social mobility in the kind of area I'm talking about and how those people would compare themselves, the primary school is a really interesting melting pot because what happens is a lot of uh, the tech sector uh, An academic children go there until 11 and then they go to private schools. Yeah. And so for the kids who are left behind or the kids who make friends with the children of uh, people who come to do a research job at AstraZeneca for three years and then move on. And these kids are left behind. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a form of hardship that doesn't get enough recognition. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about trying to find spaces and ways of bringing our neighborhood together is to try and um, do, do some sort of cementing of relationships to make sure that the, the you know, the two halves of this come together in, in sort of mutually beneficial ways. Yeah. I have learned so much from the conversations I've had with people at the Food Hub my understanding of our area is rich of that. I would love to make that more part of the discourse in the city. Thank you. And I'm really appreciative of your interest in this conference as a result of those kinds of conversations, because obviously it's just a really useful perspective to be able to impart with some of this broader research that, that speaks at a more macro level. So it has been wonderful to have um, both you and Nikki speak from different perspectives of, of deprivation in Cambridge. Obviously, it's been quite interesting to hear about how that functions in a place like Queen Edith's and the lack of resources precisely because even though Abbey Ward is quite a deprived ward, in a way there's almost a targeted response as a result of some of that deprivation, but to overlook the deprivation that happens elsewhere um, without really the appropriate infrastructure to respond to it has been a really interesting thing to come out of it. So um, once again, I'm grateful to everybody who has been with us throughout the day and hope that everybody um, has been able to get something very interesting out of these really productive conversations.